I'm Sean Dowman, Agricultural Advisor for Affinity Water. Sean, thanks ever so much for talking to the Affinity Water podcast series today. We're having a look at the forthcoming Groundswell show at the end of June 2022 in Hertfordshire. But where are we today? We are in a farmer's field in North Hertfordshire. And this field is adjacent to one of our pumping stations where we abstract water from the chalk aquifer. And we're walking towards a yellow sticker in the middle of this field and wading through quite a few, well, they're not crops, but, but certainly there's a lot of vegetation beneath our feet. But why are we walking towards the yellow pole? Well, we're, we're walking through a cover crop at the moment and we're w- walking towards the yellow stick, which marks one of our monitoring stations where we've been monitoring basically water quality in this field o- over the winter we've been assessing the amount of nitrate that is lost from this farmer's field because that's important because nitrate can have an impact on water quality. And that's what Groundswell is all about, isn't it? It's about a term called regenerative farming. Yes, that's a key focus of Groundswell is regenerative farming and and how farmers manage their farmland, how they manage their soils can have a really big impact on on many other aspects of the environment. So it can have an impact on on water quality and catchments, it can have an impact on air quality, it can impact on biodiversity. Soils can be great for, for capturing carbon. And I think that's what we're gonna we're gonna look at today and talk about today. As you said, this field is near a pumping station, so the soil quality is really important. Exactly. The soils are essentially the roof over the groundwater aquifer. So, so how those soils are managed, predominantly in this part of the world, it's, it's farmland we're talking about. You know, most of the land that surrounds our, our groundwater sources in, in this part of the world are, is farmed. So how those farmers manage the soils can have a really big impact on both the quality and quantity of water that, that we're able to abstract for drinking water. Now our listeners can probably hear that we've come to a standstill, the sort of noise of our feet treading on vegetation receding. But the, the yellow pole, now that's a marker. And what does it mark? So the yellow pole marks something called a porous pot. And you can just see the red and white wire that's sticking out of the soil there. So the porous pot is dug dug into the soil about 90 centimetres deep, which is below the rooting zone of most plants, most crops. What that porous pot does is we can collect small amounts of water from within that porous pot, suck it out of the porous pot through the tubes, and we can send that off to the lab to be analysed to, to assess water quality. And that helps us understand how much nitrate in particular is being lost from this field over winter. And the cover crops are really important uh, in terms of the whole nitrate story because cover crops are really excellent at holding on to nitrate, sucking it up, keeping it in the soil and and, and kind of incorporating it into the organic matter. So, you know, it's useful for the farmer because they don't lose their fertility of the soil. And it's useful for us because better that that nitrate's held within the soil rather than leaching into the aquifer. And I have to comment on the lovely bird sounds. Yes, we can hear skylark singing at the moment, which is another benefit of of these cover crops. They can provide a bit of extra habitat for farmland biodiversity. Certainly the skylarks are enjoying this field. The moment it hasn't been worked, it hasn't been cultivated for the next crop. So actually the fact that it's being allowed to rest at this time of year is going to be beneficial for some of those farmland birds as well. Now, you have got a spade in your hand and a silver box about three foot by two foot. Now, what's in this silver box? A box of magic tricks? <laughs> yeah, sort of. This is what's called a near-infrared scanner. And we're trialling this. We're actually part funding a PhD to look into these technologies to see how we can help farmers quickly assess the carbon content of their soils. Regenerative farming practices, a big focus on regenerative farming is about building soil carbon. If you disturb your soils as little as possible, if you grow cover crops, if you do other practices, you you can actually start building carbon in your soils and that's sucking carbon from the atmosphere. Plants are the only thing that can remove biologically that will remove carbon from the atmosphere. So and that carbon is pumped into the soil and and you can start building that carbon in the soil. The soil is a really important sink for for carbon. Now why is a water company interested in carbon? 
The amount of carbon in soils that has a clear relationship with water as well. Carbon and organic matter are very linked. So the more carbon you, you have in the soil it, it is essentially the same as more organic matter. The more organic matter you build, that, that acts as a sponge and, and you can actually hold more water in the soil. And that can stop processes like runoff, uh, that can help infiltration. So all these things are really beneficial for the water environment. So this device is a really quick and simple way of helping farmers monitor whether they're building carbon in their soils or losing carbon in their soils. And do we know, you're just about to take a reading, but from previous readings, do we know what the results speculatively might look like? Are they dramatic or, or is it slow, steady progress? Building soil carbon is certainly slow progress. It's not something that, that changes rapidly year to year. But certainly, you know, if, if a farmer is implementing the right practices, after sort of three or four years, that we, you may start to see those soil carbon re readings increase. Over a 15, 20 year period, you really can see some, some big gains in organic matter content of soils. So, you know, we are talking about realistic timescales of having a, an impact on soil carbon. But in terms of benefits to water, you, know, you get an almost immediate benefit. If a cover crop is grown over winter, compared to that being left bare, the, the water environment almost gets an immediate benefit from that because that stops runoff uh, or reg vastly reduces runoff and just starts to kind of help infiltration and stabilise that soil. So th there is an immediate benefit of doing things like growing cover crops. If we actually look at the process of supplying quality water, as Affinity Water does, uh, across its three regions to all its customers, but it must save money if the nitrates aren't in. The, the water table. Exactly. If we can keep our waters clean at source, if we can help others do that, then that, that can ultimately mean that we'll, we'll spend less money on treatment downstream. And, and that's, that's not just about money, that's actually less energy. It takes a lot of energy to, to remove things like nitrate and other pollutants from water. So if we can keep those sources as clean as possible, it saves money, saves energy, and it's, it's just it's better for the environment. You know, it's better all round to work in this way. Now, let's have a look. Do you have to dig very far? Your shovel and your uh, monitor in your hand. Let's take the reading, should we, and see what it says. Out oh. comes the mobile phone, Sean. Yes, I, I do have to, to link the scanner to an app on my phone. Uh, so that may take a few moments. It will actually take several minutes. So. <laughs> OK, well, let's just chat in terms of it's a glorious day, isn't it? And what are the cover crops? I've referred to them as vegetation. Uh, I thought I was a country girl, but clearly I'm not. Why are these cover crops special? Well, the ones that we're seeing most of around us is a plant called Phacelia. Phacelia is it's quite a hardy plant. It, it, it grows throughout the winter and, and it's this time of year it's just beginning to flower. So you can just begin to see purple flowers come out. And it's excellent for bees, Phacelia. It's a really rich nectar source. And, and in a few weeks' time, this will be absolutely buzzing with bees when these all come out into flower. But you, you get a whole range of cover crop species. We're not seeing a huge amount of diversity in here. I think we had a hard frost over winter here, so we lost some of the other species. But we can see things like there's clovers coming through here. This is a crimson clover. And again, that will... Clovers are great. They're a legume, so they actually fix nitrogen. So they actually give the farmer some free nitrogen into the soil. And that reduces the amount of artificial nitrogen they have to use. And that's a really important process as well. But you can get other species like oil radish, turnip rape, mustards, and, and those are really good species at capturing nitrate. So every different cover crop species does something a little bit different for the farm. They have a biodiversity value. They're not native crops, they're part of the farmer's cropping system. And this is about doing things in the field. The main purpose of the farmer is to grow food in these fields, and we're not getting away from that. That is the clear value of, of this land, is to produce food that we all need. But these cover crops kind of fill a gap. They fill gaps in that farming rotation. So that, that there's always gonna be times of the year where there isn't a crop being grown in the land and, and a crop that's harvested for food. And that's where the cover crops come in because they can fill that gap. They can capture more of the sun's energy. They can build soil fertility. They can provide some nectaring sources for, for bees and butterflies. But we're not talking about rewilding here. We're not talking about turning this back to a, a native meadow. It's actually more about maximising those gaps in the farming calendar where we can provide a bit more environmental value. 
Now, as I look across this field, as I said, a glorious day, blue sky, sun shining, birds singing, and a few aeroplanes overhead. But there is an ominous green strip, which has nothing on it. Now, I presume that's your control area. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, this field we've set up as a trial, and we have this strip in the middle where we didn't plant a cover crop, and we've done exactly the same thing in the control plot as we've done in the cover crop plot where we've monitored nitrate losses throughout the autumn winter months and the data was very conclusive this year as it often is when we do these trials we saw higher nitrate losses in the strip without the cover crop compared to where we did have the cover crop so for us it's really clear evidence of the value of having a cover crop on fields over winter especially so close to one of our pumping stations you know we're literally less than 50 meters away from from our borehole so this field in particular it's it's particularly important to, to to have this sort of practice because it's so close and can have such a you know immediate impact on water quality now earlier you did say when i asked about progress slow or dramatic you said progress is slow perhaps over 15 20 years but you seem to be saying actually you can see the results fairly quickly but certainly with things Things like water quality, you see immediate results on the surface. Carbon is something slightly different. Carbon, soil organic matter, takes longer time to, to build up. But, but yeah, like I say, you can see more immediate impact on water quality. It's slightly more complicated in above chalk aquifers because actually nitrate can, can take many decades to, to travel through the chalk and have an impact on water quality. So it is a complex picture, but certainly if this field was next to a river for example if we had a river running beside it then stopping any runoff processes will have an immediate effect now it's may we've just turned into early may we can see all the so-called may bloom out as well on the the hedges but it wouldn't be normal to see a cover crop still in a field in may would it we associate cover crops with winter and them being the precursor to the real crop being planted exactly exactly this this isn't common practice to to still have a cover crop growing at this time of year exactly as you said normally the farmer would uh, would get rid of this cover crop in maybe january february time and then plant their spring crop crop something like spring barley spring peas but in this instance we're trialing the the benefits of keeping this cover crop in all year round for, for one year like I say, allowing the cover crop to flower will have benefits for biodiversity. Allowing the plants to get a bit, bit bigger, their roots to develop more will have benefits for the soil. No nitrogen will be used on this field, no, no herbicides. So actually it's, it's giving the land a bit of a rest for a year. It's you know, allowing that soil fertility to build up a little bit. And yes, you lose a bit of food production value for the year, but it's actually something historically that farmers would have done a lot more. They would have had periods of fallow a lot more regularly in, in their rotations. So we're trialling what the benefits are of doing this and we're going to monitor bees over, over the summer. We're going to monitor some bird populations to see whether there's an increase in things like skylark breeding on, on fields like this. So there is a wider environmental value of, of doing things like this. Now you're holding your mobile app in your hand so this is the moment is it Sean when we get the reading? Yes, exactly. We perform this scan on the soil and it, can, it takes only about five minutes to complete the whole process. The mobile phone is linked to your monitoring device. Exactly, through Bluetooth. It, it takes the reading on the device and via Bluetooth it, you, you can basically access the reading almost immediately. So if I look at the report for this particular field, we get figures such as the, the amount of organic carbon and we, we're given a, a dial red, green or yellow and it, it tells us you know whether we're, we're doing well. This particular field, it's, it's doing pretty well. We're about in the middle, 23 grams per kilogram of organic carbon in this soil. It also tells us total nitrogen, clay content, pH. So this is just a really rapid way of assessing carbon content in the soil. It's not as accurate as a lab-based method, so we're not saying this is replacing taking a soil sample and sending it off to the lab. That's a slow process and that, that can be quite costly for the farmer. So we're seeing if through providing technology such as this, can we help farmers monitor and, and build soil carbon in, in our catchments ultimately, on their land and in our catchments, because more soil organic matter, more soil carbon is only going to be a better thing for our water catchments. And the answer is yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and you'll be taking that good news to Groundswell at the end of June with Paul and John Cherry, the Cherry brothers, and ministers attend 
now. It's a big agricultural event, isn't it? This, you know, alternative farming or regenerative farming. It's it's not organic farming. It's no-till farming. They don't use the big farm machinery. But but are you going to be displaying this, showing people just what can be achieved? Yes, we're going to have the Affinity Water Catchment Hub at Groundswell. We like to use this space as a way of you know, demonstrating some of the different research projects we're working on. So we're going to have some posters displaying some of the information, but we're also going to demo this device with our PhD student, Jess, from the University of Reading. She's going to be there and she's going to demo this device, talk about her PhD, and we'll just be able to talk more generally about why soil health, Building soil carbon is not only good for the farmer, good for the environment, it's good for water and it's good for water companies if more of that happens. And why do you think ministers are so interested in this at the moment? There's lots of change in in farming techniques and and how land is going to be used in the future, isn't there? Definitely. I mean, we we are a farmed nation, the UK. 70% of our land is, is farmland. Thinking about all the processes and the value of, of the, the natural capital value of land, which there is so much more value to land other than just the food that we produce from it or the inherent economic value of that land. There's, there's the natural capital. We have to work with farmers if we want to maximise the amount of natural capital that flows from land. And I think that's why government and, and ministers are so interested in it, because we need to do things differently. We're in a climate crisis, we're in a biodiversity crisis, so we've got challenges ahead with supplying water. The the changing climate is going to create some headaches for us in the water industry, especially in the southeast of England where we've got high population, relatively dry. We're in May now, we haven't had much rainfall. So we really need to be thinking carefully and smartly about how land is managed because that has such a big influence on, on so many other aspects of our lives. And we know it's something that Affinity Waters 3.6 million customers care about too because they've told us they do. They care about the environment. And we talk a lot about water quality and being custodians of the environment for our customers and our communities. But it's worth noting, isn't it, that this isn't the first year Affinity Water has sponsored Groundswell. We were in early before people had heard about it I think it's probably our sixth year this year it is the sixth year since we started sponsoring it there was obviously a gap with Covid but yeah this is our sort of officially the fifth year that we've we've sponsored the event we recognized early on this was a special event we were lucky that it it was it was happening in our patch in Hertfordshire we were asked if we'd like to sponsor it not something we do that often as a water company sponsor events but but we thought it felt like the right thing to do we're not there to sell anything to anyone we're not there to sell water to farmers we're literally there to acknowledge and support regenerative farming because that's it, we, we acknowledge the benefit that, that can have for, for the water environment and the wider environment. It's such an important issue. And it's been great going back each year and seeing how the event has grown each year from a relatively small do-it-yourself event in the first year to what is now a very professional, you know, well-organised interesting fun brilliant event I we always come away from it having learned lots feeling inspired and having spoken to lots of really interesting people doing interesting things and just finally it's quite something when you see Paul and John Cherry holding soil in their hand when they've done no-till farming for 20 years you know no big 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 farm machinery on their land as I say it's not organic they do use fertilizers when needed but yeah. minimally so you know the structure of the soil benefits from regenerative farming definitely definitely it's it's when you see a comparison of you know on the same soil type of, of these different management approaches maybe a traditionally farmed ploughed field compared to, to one that has had you know minimal tillage no tillage and, and cover crops you can see it in the top sort of few inches the soil is starting to get darker you can you can see the worms you can smell the soil you know I was out with a farmer a few weeks ago and we were smelling the soil we probably looked like crazy people stood in this field smelling sniffing soil but you could smell how sweet and healthy his soil smell and we compared it to neighboring field really didn't have that same smell and it's those kind of senses and it doesn't (laughs) stick to your hands or boots either it's, it's you know it's tangible 
Exactly, exactly. There's all those signs, and you know, there's there's science that backs it up as well. There's there's good science to to show that doing this these type of practices are beneficial for, for the soil itself, for the environment. I'm not saying it's the only answer. There may be some fields, some farms where it's not appropriate, and they may need to plough for other reasons. And we're not being dogmatic about that. It's just, I think, farming in this way, where appropriate, in the right place, if it works for the farmer, then the benefits can be really great for many other reasons. Mm-hmm.